Well, as you can see in this discussion, we're going to talk about calculus and polar coordinates, uh, specifically derivatives and uh, tangent lines, equations of tangent lines, and, and so on. And we're going to rely heavily on uh, what we did with parametric equations. That's what's really going to get us started here. Is, uh, this is an important statement, and that's the way we're going to approach things. Uh, it Maybe it's surprising that when we're calculating the slope of the tangent line to a graph uh, of a polar equation, r is equal to f of theta, uh, that the, the slope is not the derivative f prime of theta or derivative r with respect to theta. Not at all. Remember what slope is. Slope refers to the amount of vertical change per unit of horizontal change, which is a rectangular coordinate system concept. That's rectangular coordinates. Horizontal, x-axis, vertical, y-axis. The slope of the tangent line is still given by the derivative of y with respect to x. And there lies our problem. Our function, our polar equation, is in terms of r and theta. So we have to turn to parametric equations. We do know how to deal with parametric equations. So to find the slope, we use the definition of our, the polar equation we have, r equal f of theta, along with the facts we know from polar coordinates that x is equal to r times cosine theta and y is equal to r times sine theta. We'll use those to create parametric equations as we see below. So since x is equal to r cosine theta and furthermore r is equal to f of theta, we get the equation x is equal to f of theta times cosine theta and likewise for y y is equal to f of theta times sine of theta. So these become the parametric equations for the polar equation that uh, we started with. So we call from parametric equations to find the derivative of y with respect to x when uh, x and y are defined as parametric equations we take the derivative of y with respect to the parameter, theta in this case, and divide by the derivative of x with respect to the same parameter, again, theta in this case. So all we need to be able to do is to calculate the derivative of y with respect to theta and the derivative of x with respect to theta. And we'll have to use the product rule. As we're using the product rule for calculating the derivative of y with respect to theta and the derivative of x with respect to theta, we start setting up our derivative of y with respect to x as a quotient of derivatives. And, uh, of course, y is defined right here as a product. That's why we're using the product rule. And so we'll say, okay, the derivative of the first function, in this case, that's f of theta, so it will be f prime of theta times the second function, which is just sine of theta. And then we add to that, of course, the reversal, the second function, which is the sine of theta, times, excuse me, um, the derivative of the second function, or actually, I apologize, we'll say just the function, the first function times the derivative of the second function. Since the second function is sine of theta, its derivative is cosine theta. So that's the derivative of y with respect to theta using the product rule. In a similar fashion, in the denominator, we'll have the derivative of x with respect to theta. We also use the product rule. So here we'll say the derivative of the first function, f prime of theta, times the second function, which is cosine of theta.
and uh, then we'll of course reverse that and we'll say the first function times the derivative of the second function. Well, of course, the first function is f of theta. I skipped the sign for a reason here. And the derivative of the second function being cosine of theta, the derivative is negative sine theta. So that's actually going to make this a negative, isn't it? And we're going to have sine theta here. So just a little adjustment uh, only, just to make, sh uh, make a point. F prime of theta is really the derivative of R with respect to theta. So we could write this as the derivative of R with respect to theta times the sine of theta plus uh, R. Remember, R is just what F of theta. So R times the cosine of theta. Oh, I'm scrunched, aren't I? Divided by F prime of theta again is derivative of R with respect to theta times cosine theta minus f of theta, again, is just r times sine of theta. This is another way we could write that. Now, all of this is only going to work provided that our denominator is not zero, as provided that the derivative of x with respect to theta itself is not equal to zero. And we're really talking then at a particular value of theta is really what we're talking about there. I guess I said, said shape. I should say for the record, I don't know that I would try to memorize this formula. I would remember how to derive it. Uh, that you know, if we understand where it comes from, then it's easy for us to create this formula anytime we're ready to use it. As you can see in this discussion, we're going to talk about calculus and polar coordinates. The first example I'd like to look at is uh, actually finding the slope of a tangent line to a rose curve. So our problem is to find the slope of the tangent line to the graph of r equal 4 sine 3 theta. Uh, at the value theta equal pi over 6. Now we recognize that this is a rose curve. Here is our curve. Um, like I said, it's a little sketch. It's the, the, the uh, parameters that we're working under. And of course, this is the angle theta right here that is pi over 6. And so it's at the end of that pedal that we're actually uh, dealing with the tangent line, and we want to know its slope. So we begin with the idea that x is equal to r times cosine of theta. And, of course, in this case, since we know what r is, and that means that uh, r being 4 times sine of 3 theta, that's the value of r. And so x is 4 times the sine of 3 theta times cosine theta. And in a similar fashion, we know that y is equal to r times sine of theta generally in polar equations. Once again, since r is 4 times sine of 3 theta, what we have here is 4 times sine of 3 theta times sine of theta. Now we have our x and y defined. So we need to find the derivative of x, excuse me, the derivative of y with respect to x, which is the derivative of y with respect to theta divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta. Well, as we look at the definition of y, okay, if we look at the definition of y, and we use the uh, 
product rule to calculate the derivative of y with respect to theta. Let's see what we would have. Let's see if you agree with me. Um, we'll take the derivative of the first function. Remember, we've got a product, and so I'm thinking of this as the first function right here. So we'll take the derivative of the first function, which is 4 sine 3 theta. Well, that derivative will be 4 times cosine of 3 theta, but then we have to take the derivative of 3 theta, which is 3. So that 4 times that 3 will give us a 12 cosine of 3 theta. And we're multiplying with the second function, sine of theta. And then we'll add to that the reversal, basically, won't we? That is, we'll say the first function, which is 4 times sine of 3 theta, times the derivative of the second function. And the derivative of sine of theta is, of course, here's the second function, it's just sine of theta. So the derivative of sine of theta is just cosine theta. Now, the, I got a little lopsided there, didn't I? The, the, now, the denominator is the derivative of x with respect to theta. So, to calculate the derivative of x with respect to theta, of course, we look up there and we do the same kind of thing. The derivative of the first function, again, the first function is 4 sine 3 theta. So, we'll get the same derivative, 12 times cosine of 3 theta, but we multiply with the second function, which is cosine of theta. And then we'll turn around and, oops, and we'll turn around and, and uh, we'll end up with a negative here. And I'm kind of ahead of myself. So I really should have uh, not put a plus. That was just, and maybe we would in practice, we would have a plus there. Because we're going to add to that the first function times the derivative of the second. First function being 4 times sine of 3 theta. And the second function is cosine of theta. When we take the derivative of cosine of theta, we get negative sine theta. And so that's where that negative instead of that plus in front comes from, that, that subtraction sign. Okay, so there we've gone through that process. And, and in some cases, it may be more complicated and it takes a little more work for us. Um, but that's good enough for here. Now, we could simplify that, but all we really want to know is the slope of the tangent line. And so that slope, remember, the slope of that tangent line will be the derivative evaluated at the theta value pi over 6. So it's simply a matter of putting a bunch of, doing a bunch of calculations, that is, doing a bunch of evaluations. So we'll have 12 times the cosine of 3 theta, and of course theta is pi over 6, so it will be 3 times pi over 6, times the sine of theta, which is just pi over 6, plus 4 times the sine of 3 theta, that's 3 times the pi over 6. And finally here, the cosine of theta, once again, which is pi over 6. Now our denominator will be 12 times the cosine of 3 theta times the cosine of just theta. Subtract 4 times the sine of 3 theta once again times the sine of theta which of course is 5 or 6. Now, here, I think we'll have a bunch of simplifications. Let's, let's see what happens. Uh, remember, in the numerator, uh, cosine of 3 of pi over 6. Well, 3 pi over 6 is actually pi over 2, isn't it? 3 times pi over 6. So we have the cosine of pi over 2, which is 0. Now, the sine of pi over 6, I guess we really don't need to know at this uh, stage since we're multiplying with a zero, but the sine of pi over six is actually one half, isn't it? Plus um, four times pi 
four times sine of three pi over three times pi over six. Well, that's the sine of pi over two, and the sine of pi over two is one times the cosine of pi over six, and the cosine of pi over six is the square root of three over two. Now in the denominator, let's look, we have 12 times cosine of, z, of uh, pi over 2 again, which is a 0, times the cosine of pi over 6, of course, which is square root of 3 over 2. But that 0 factor is going to change all that, isn't it? We're going to make everything 0 there. Anyway, minus 4 times the sine of pi over 2, 3 times pi over 6. So we have 4 times 1, and the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So as we simplify, we'll notice, of course, the first 12 times 0 times 1 half is just 0. So all this is 0. And all of this is 0. So we're left with 4 times the square root of 3 over 2 divided by a negative 4 times a 1 half. And clearly in the numerator, we end up with just um, two roots, two square roots of three, and in the denominator, we just end up with a negative two, and of course, that will simply simplify to a negative square root of three. So, the, of course, the negative makes sense as we look at our diagram, and that is negative slope, and it's exactly the slope of negative square root of three. Well, as we continue this problem, I'd like next to let's let's find the equation of that tangent line. So uh, our our job is to find the equation of the tangent line, and by the way, in rectangular coordinates, to the curve that we uh, were just dealing with, the rose curve r equal four sine three theta at theta equal pi over six. And, uh, of course, we have the diagram of what that looks like. Um, and we've already determined that the slope of that tangent line, we did that just now, didn't we? The slope of the tangent line is negative square root of 3. Now, just as a refresher, just to remind you that to calculate the equation of any line in two dimensions, okay, to calculate the equation of any line in two dimensions, we need two pieces of information. We need the slope of the line and we need a point that is on the line. Now, of course, don't get this confused with two points determine a line. That's true. And with two points, we can come up with the equation of a line. But to do that, we use the two points to find the slope. So what really determines the equation of a line is the slope of the line and a point that it goes through. Now, we have two options. This is this is really calculus one review and maybe even a little bit before that. We know that if we're writing this in rectangular coordinates, we're going to have the form that is assuming that it's not a vertical line. We haven't talked about that yet. And we know it's not vertical though because the slope is negative square root of three. So the equation of the line could be of this form. And we know the m value, the slope, and uh, we don't know b. We don't know where it crosses the y-axis. That's at b, isn't it? But since we, uh, and, and we, if we could find a point that is on the line, then we could proceed further. Okay, then we could proceed further and we could solve for b. Now, more frequently than not anymore, we use what's called the point-slope form of the equation of a line. And many times I call it the point-slope formula. And so it looks a little different in the way we approach this. Okay. 
So it, it's kind of set up for us to say, oh, we need the slope and we need a point. Because in this form, the X and Y, without the subscripts, of course, are the, the uh, variables in the function. M represents slope, and X subscript 1 and Y subscript 1 represent a point that we know that is on the line. The whole problem here is we've got the slope. That's no, no issue, but we don't have a point that is on the line except the point of tangency. And the point of tangency is uh, when theta is equal to pi over 6. Well, remember, you know, this, this is a big deal. Remember that from there we know that x is equal to r times cosine of theta, don't we? And we know that y is equal to r times sine of theta. Now, since we know what theta is and we know r generally, okay, remember what r is, let's come up here, r is 4 times the sine of 3 theta. and times our cosine of theta. So we simply find x by substituting pi over 6 in for theta. I think maybe I've run myself out of space here. 4 times the sine of, well, 3 theta. Theta is pi over 6. 3 times theta is pi over 2. Times the cosine of, I'm sorry for being out of space here, of theta which is pi over 6. Well, let me, let me, uh, uh, sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we have 4 times 1, and cosine of pi over 6, that is all bungled up there, isn't it? Which is um, the square root of 3 over 2, and so we have 4 times the square root of 3 over 2, which is simply 2 square roots of 3. It's just, what's important is how I calculated that. Likewise, for y, we're going to go through the same process. We're going to say, okay, r is 4 times the sine of 3 theta. In this case, theta is pi over 2. So we have 3 times pi over 2, excuse me, pi over 6. 3 times pi over 6, which is pi over 2. Times the cosine of theta, in this case, uh, um, pardon me, times the sine of theta. Well, I really bungled this, haven't I? My, my bad. I'm very sorry for this. Okay. 4 times the sine of 3 theta, theta being pi over 2. Remember, that's what this is what r is. Uh, theta being r uh, uh, 3 times pi over, the, pi over 6 then, which will give us a pi over 2, then times the sine of pi over 6, our theta. And in this case, we get, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, 4 times sine of pi over 2 is 1, and sine of pi over 6 is 1 half, and so we simply get a 2. So our x value is this 2 times the square root of 3, and our y value is 2. So now we have the point that we needed, don't we? And the point we have is 2 root 3, comma 2, in rectangular coordinates, and the slope we have of course, is negative square root of 3. So if we go uh, to our equation, our point-slope form, what we would end up with then is y minus our y value 2 of the point we know is on the line is equal to our slope, negative square root of 3, times x minus uh, our x value, x value, the x value of the point we know is on the line, which is 2 square root of 3. Now, we would do a little massaging here, and that is we would multiply out the negative square root of 3, so we'd get negative square root of 3 times an x, and uh, we'll have a plus 2 times the square root of 3 squared, that's 2 times 3, or 6. And then we would uh, certainly just uh, add the 2 to both sides. We'd have negative square root of 3 times x plus a 6 plus 2. And so there is the equation of our in rectangular coordinates of the tangent line in question. 
Now, I might add that this is not what we were asked to do, but what if? What if we were asked to write the uh, equation in polar coordinates? What is the tangent line equation in polar coordinates? In polar coordinates. Well, that means we just need to convert. Okay, that shouldn't be too difficult for us to do. To convert We'll, once again, we'll replace each x, see, we'll use the fact that now we're away from what we were doing just a moment ago. We're just doing a conversion from rectangular uh, coordinates to polar coordinates in terms of our equation. So we'll use the fact that we know that x is always equal to r times uh, cosine of theta. So every time we see an x, we'll put an r cosine theta. And... Uh, y is equal to r times sine of theta, so every time we see a y, we'll put an r sine theta. So we take our equation, which says y is equal to, well, y is r times r, uh, y is r times sine of theta. And that's equal to negative square root of 3 times x, but x is r cosine theta. And then we have our plus 8. Now, if we're going to solve this for r, which we probably would like to do, then let's um, add the negative root 3 r cosine theta to both sides. So we'll have r sine theta plus root 3 r cosine theta is equal to 8. Now, we see that r is a common factor on the left side, so we'll factor that r out. And we'll have r times the sine of theta plus root 3 cosine theta is equal to 8. And now we're in a position that we can actually solve for r by dividing out that coefficient or that factor. So we'll divide on both sides by this sine of theta times three, uh, root 3 cosine theta. And when we do, we'll have r is equal to 8 divided by sine of theta plus root 3 cosine of theta. That's the equation of the tangent line in polar coordinates. Now this would be useful, for instance, if we wanted to make a graph. And what I mean by that, if we graphed our rose curve, we graphed our rose curve using polar coordinates. We were using a graphing uh, calculator or if we're using maple and we were graphing this polar graph this rose curve we would use one system and we couldn't turn around and at the same time graph something in rectangular coordinates so having this line in polar coordinates would let us graph both the rose curve and the tangent line simultaneously so we could actually see how they fit together that would be the usefulness there <laughs> Well, next we're going to uh, look at finding horizontal and vertical tangent lines of a uh, cardioid. Well, this problem is about finding uh, horizontal and vertical tangent lines. So as you can see, we're to find the points on the graph of r equal 3 minus 3 sine theta, which we recognize is a cardioid, don't we? Where a, the tangent line or lines is horizontal, and b, the tangent line or lines are vertical. So we may have uh, more than one of these tangent lines that are horizontal and more than one of these tangent lines that are vertical, and we're supposed to find all of the points for which those things happen. Now, many times we may not be working with a graph, but I think in this case, what I would like to do is uh, 
to, to sketch a graph of, of the uh, function that we're dealing with, uh, just so that we can imagine when we see our results what's happening. So as I draw my axis, and I know this graph is uh, uh, symmetric about the y-axis, and I know that when uh, theta is negative 3 pi over 2, uh, excuse me, when the sine of uh, when theta is 3 pi over 2, I have a sine value that's negative 1, and so my r value is 3 minus 3 times negative 1, or 3 plus 3, or 6. And so that will mean down here we're at a value of 6. Okay? And, of course, when theta is pi over 2, then my uh, uh, sine value is 1, and so r would be 0, and so I'm at this point. And I look at when theta is 0, then I have an r value of 3. I'm at this point. Uh, I haven't marked this off. I'm just giving you an idea of where I'm going to mark it. And this is when, when uh, uh, theta is pi, then I, once again I get r is 3. And so I'm at this point. So I actually when I draw this graph, I'm going to start it just because it's difficult from my position to start it where it really starts. It should start over here at this point. But I'm going to start it at this uh, pole and see if I can't draw this graph. And, of course, I'm not perfect. You recognize that in my graph drawing. Okay. There we've got our graph. And so you can imagine it appears that we ought to have... Uh, maybe three different horizontal tangent lines here. Looks like looks like maybe roughly here we would have a point where there, the tangent line would be horizontal. So it looks like we're going to have a horizontal tangent line there. I kind of got off, didn't I? And maybe roughly someplace in here we'll have a horizontal tangent line as well. So that makes a little bit of sense there, doesn't it? Okay. Uh, and it looks like down here we'd have a horizontal tangent line, wouldn't we? So we're going to actually have three different horizontal tangent lines, it, it appears, okay? Uh, we'll go through the process of how we find those points, although here we can, we can certainly uh, identify one of the points pretty quickly on that bottom tangent line. And then, obviously, it appears that maybe we would have a vertical tangent line roughly about here, okay? And it looks like in a similar position over here, we'd have a vertical tangent line. Uh, so it looks like we actually have two different vertical tangent lines and three different horizontal tangent lines. Okay. Well, let's go about the process and recall how we did this with parametric equations because that's the big deal here. Recall uh, from parametric equations that a horizontal tangent line occurs at a point or any point for which the derivative of y with respect to theta is zero, but the derivative of x with respect to theta is not zero. And, and let me remind you of why that's the case, okay? To have a horizontal tangent line means the derivative would itself have to be zero. And the derivative, the derivative of y with respect to x is what we're talking about, would have to be zero. But the derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of y with respect to theta, divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta. So for that derivative to be 0, then that must mean that the derivative here must be 0. That fraction, to have a fraction have the value of 0, that would have to be 0. And of course, it would no, make no sense for the denominator to be 0, we would be undefined, wouldn't we? So that's the reason we say that we have to find the derivative of y where the, the value is theta, where the derivative of y with respect to theta is zero, but at the same time, the derivative of x with respect to theta is not zero. So we start going about our business then, using that information. In our function, okay, in our function, uh, you know, 
we, let, let's determine x and y again, okay, because we're taking the derivative of each of those. So remember, x is r times cosine of theta, generally. And in our case, the x value, uh, excuse me, the r value is 3 mi minus 3 sine theta. So x is 3 minus 3 sine theta times cosine of theta. Likewise, since y generally is r times the sine of theta, specifically for us, r is 3 minus 3 sine theta. So y is 3 minus 3 sine theta times sine theta. Now we could do some simplification there. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but we could directly calculate the derivative of y with respect to x as well. Okay, we could do that directly by just using, whoops, excuse me, theta, the derivative of y with respect to theta. We could do, use that, do that directly by just using the product rule. So we'll take the derivative of the first function that's here, and we're talking about y, and the derivative of that first function, well, the derivative of 3 is 0. So we'll have 0 minus the derivative of 3 sine theta, and the derivative of 3 sine theta is, of course, 3 cosine theta. So that's the derivative of the first function and then multiply with the second function. And let's just say theta, let's forego those parentheses. Plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Okay. Well, let's say this, this, the derivative of the second function times the first function. That's an, another way to, to kind of make this look simpler. Uh, I, I, I did it the way I said, okay. The first function times the derivative of the second. Well, the first function is 3 minus 3 times sine theta times the derivative of the second function. The derivative of sine of theta is cosine theta. Now, we can do a little simplification here. Uh, in the first term, we have a negative 3 cosine theta sine theta. I'm going to rearrange that and say sine theta, cosine theta. And uh, as we distribute the cosine theta over here, we'll have plus 3 cosine theta minus 3 sine theta, cosine theta. And uh, that'll simplify further. I see that we'll have a 3 cosine theta, that's that middle term, but we've got minus 6 sine theta cosine theta, don't we? Okay, so we want to know where that's equal to 0. So the derivative of y with respect to theta being equal to 0 Oh, that means we've got to solve the trig equation. We've got to solve this equation. 3 cosine three, th uh, 3 cosine theta minus 6 sine theta cosine theta is equal to 0. So when we're doing these things, we may have some significant trig equations to solve. Uh, that may happen. Let's see what we're going to do here. Well, I'm noticing 3 cosine theta is a common factor. So I can factor out 3 cosine theta. And then I'll have, what, 1 minus 2 sine theta as my remaining factor. Well, now that I have that uh, factored, I can set each factor to 0 quite simply. So I'd have uh, 3 cosine theta equals 0. And I would have 1 minus 2 sine theta equals 0. Of course, here, this is just simply, when I divide through by 3, I get cosine of theta is equal to 0. And when is that going to happen? 
that's going to happen when theta is pi over 2 or 3 pi over 2. We're just looking at one revolution. To create this graph, we just need to, you know, I, I didn't say that above, but by now I hopefully understand that we get this whole graph from 0 to 2 pi. And we really don't need to include 2 pi because we get the same point. The starting point is where 2 pi takes us. So those are, uh, we just need to find thetas between 0 and 2 pi, including 0, but not 2 pi. Now on the other hand, this other equation, when we uh, subtract 1 and divide by negative 2, we'll end up with the sine of theta is equal to positive 1 half. And that's going to happen when theta is equal to pi over 6 or 5 pi over 6. Now, let, 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 let me remind you what we have to do next. Remember, we have to make sure that the derivative of y with respect to theta is zero, but we also have to make sure that the derivative of y with respect, uh, the derivative of x with respect to theta is not zero. You know, and we haven't found the derivative of x with respect to theta, but what do we mean? We found four thetas for which the derivative of y is zero. That's what we've just found. But which of those or any of those is the derivative of x with respect to theta not zero? That was, what that means is we've got to find dx d theta and determine whether these thetas make that zero or not. Now here's, because we have the graph already, recognizing we only have three points where we have a horizontal tangent line. So I suspect for one of these theta values, we can't use. And the reason we can't use it is because the derivative of x with respect to theta there is going to actually be zero. And so that's the reason we won't be able to use it. But we haven't done that part yet. So I'm, I'm cheating a bit, making uh, illustrating with our graph what's going to happen. But um, it's pretty important that we go through the process because sometimes the graph is too hard to, to calculate and it wouldn't mean anything if we did. So um, as we start on the next page, well, we need to know the derivative of x with respect to theta before we can evaluate it. And so we have to use, remember x is uh, the quantity 3 minus 3 sine theta times cosine theta. And so we're going to use the product rule again. And, and uh, when we do, uh, you'll, if you'll allow me, we won't go through all of the, the business there, but we'll get first negative 3 cosine theta times cosine theta plus... 3 minus 3 sine theta times negative sine theta. And that's just using the, you know, the first term. Remember, we had, uh, I said derivative of the first, and the, and the first was 3 minus 3 sine theta, and that's how we got the negative 3 cosine theta. Times the second function was cosine theta. And then it's the first function, which is 3 minus 3 sine theta, times the derivative of the second, since the second function is cosine theta, we get a negative sine theta result. Now, as we uh, simplify this a bit, or just rearrange it some, let me write it down here, uh, we'll have negative 3 cosine squared theta um, and minus 3 sine theta as we distribute that sine theta in this second term over here and then we'll have plus 3 sine squared theta. So that's our derivative of x with respect to theta and we're going to probably use that again in a moment anyway but what, the way we're going to use it right now is we have to decide remember what our thetas are. We, we have four different uh, thetas and I'm going to write smallest to largest. One of them is pi over 6. And then uh, pi over 2. And then, uh, what, 5 pi over 6. 
and then uh, three pi over two. Okay, those are our theta values. And so the question is, is the derivative of x with respect to theta at these particular theta values equal to zero or not? That's that's the issue. If it's not zero, then it's a good theta value. Okay, so we simply check. So the derivative of x with respect to theta for the first theta value, which is pi over 6, we check its value. And uh, I will do the, well, let's, let's, let's come over here and do the calculations. We'll have negative 3 times cosine, oops, cosine squared of pi over 6 minus 3 times the sine of pi over 6 plus 3 times sine squared of pi over 6. Well, the cosine of pi over 6 is the square root of 3 over 2. So this is nothing more than negative 3 times the square root of 3 over 2 squared. The sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So this is minus 3 times a 1 half. And plus 3 times, again, the sine of pi over 6 is a 1 half. So here we have a sine squared or a 1 half squared. And if we do our calculations, this is a negative 3. Okay, so that means this is a good pi value because it's not zero, right? That's the whole thing. It's not zero. Okay, now we go and we check the derivative of x with respect to theta at the next theta value. That is at theta equal pi over 2. Okay, well, let's just think this out. What I'm doing is I'm looking up here, okay, and I'm going to have a negative 3 times the cosine of pi over 2. It's cosine squared. And cosine of pi over 2 is 0, so we have a 0 squared there. Minus 3 times the sine of pi over 2. Well, the sine of pi over 2 is 1, so we just have minus 3 times 1. Plus 3 times sine squared of pi over 2. Well, sine of pi over 2 is 1, and when we square that, we would have 1 squared. And if you look here, we have nothing more than negative 3 plus 3, which is 0. This is equal to 0. So this is not, power 2 is not a good theta value for us. We can't use it. Well, we go through and we check the derivative of x with respect to theta for the next theta value, which is 5 pi over 6. Well, you know how we're going about this. Uh, as I calculate this time, I get negative 3, like I did above, which is not 0. So that means this is a good theta value. And lastly, I'm not going to go through the details again. You know what to do. But we're going to check for the theta value 3 pi over 2. And when I check the theta value this time, uh, I get a positive 6. Okay. All I'm doing is putting those theta values up here into the derivative. At this time, I get a 6, which is not 0. So this is another good theta value. Okay? Well, now we need to know our points. See, that's, that's the question now. We were asked for what points. And so the points we need to do, we need to calculate the r value as well. So we have theta. Okay? We have theta is equal to pi over 6 as a good theta value. But what r value do we have? Okay, What r value do we have? Uh, well, let's see. Our, uh, I've got to stop and think what we had. Oh, r is 3 minus 3 times sine of theta, isn't it? So it's 3 minus 3 times sine of pi over 6. And so that's what 3... Um, minus 3 times the sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. So it's 3 minus 3 halves, which is actually 3 halves. 
and then for theta equal to, uh, we can't use pi over 2, but we can use 5 pi over 6. Well, that says, okay, then that tells us r is 3 minus 3 times the sine of 5 pi over 6. And when we do this calculation, we get 3 halves again. And then theta is equal to, uh, what, 3 pi over 2 is our next value of theta. And in that case, we get r is equal to 3 minus 3 times sine of 3 pi over 2. And when we do this calculation, we get a positive 6. So the horizontal, we have horizontal tangent lines. And so we were trying to find um, at these three points. The first point, it has an R value of 3 halves and a theta value of pi over 6. The second point has an R value of 3 halves and a theta value of 5 pi over 6. And um, the third point of horizontal tangency has an R value of, of uh, 6 and a theta value of 3 pi over 2. Now, those are the polar coordinates. Okay. If for some reason we wanted rectangular coordinates, okay, if we wanted the rectangular coordinates, well, here's what they would be. Rectangular form. The first point would be 3 root 3 over 4 divided uh, at comma 3 fourths. 3 root 3 over 4, and the second coordinate, that's the x-coordinate, the y-coordinate is 3 fourths. The second point has an x-value of negative 3 root 3. Negative 3 root 3 over 4, and a y-value of 3 fourths. And the last point has an, an x value of 0 and a y value of negative 6. How did I do that? I simply used r is equal to, uh, excuse me, not r, x is equal to r times cosine of theta, and y is equal to r times sine of theta to do the conversion from my polar points above to my rectangular points below. Let me just real quickly, I'm going to sketch this in and not try to be so neat about it, but let me just real quickly sketch in what we've done here. Remember, this is what our graph looked like. Well, except it's prettier than that, isn't it? And what we've found, remember, this was, uh, this was out here at 3, and this is down here 6 units, and here's 3. And so we found this point, this point and this point in that order, okay? And from a, you know, you can kind of maybe imagine that that looks like that's probably close to correct, but look look at our angles and our, uh, we can look at polar and figure it out. We can look at uh, rectangular and figure it out. Yes, that makes sense where those points are. Okay, well, what we have left, though, is to calculate the vertical tangent lines where those vertical tangent lines occur. Uh, and we would certainly use the same idea. In fact, I don't know that I'll even go through it. The, 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 let's make a point, though. To calculate the vertical tangent lines, or not calculate, calculate the points at which those occur, vertical tangent lines, we have to be worried about the derivative of x with respect to theta being equal to zero, but simultaneously the derivative of y with respect to theta is not equal to zero. And it goes back to what we did earlier. 
is we we want to know where we have a vertical tangent line. And, and our tangent line slopes are defined by the derivative of y with respect to x. And so if it's vertical, then this has to be undefined. Okay. And for the, and, but remember, for that to be undefined, remember what it is. Since the derivative of y with respect to x is the derivative of y with respect to theta, divided by the derivative of x with respect to theta, the way that fraction is going to be undefined is if that is equal to zero. So it were equal to zero there. Now the numerator can't be equal to zero because then we'd have an then we would have an indeterminate form, zero over zero. And in that indeterminate form, the truth is we don't know. We have no if not enough information to know whether the derivative itself is undefined. So if we have both derivatives equal to zero, that's not enough information to tell us. Well, I really bungled that up. <clears throat> I'm so sorry. Well, I'm looking above. This is nonsense, right? We need the derivative of x with respect to theta to be equal to zero but the derivative of y with respect to theta not to be equal to zero. And it's because of the fraction we have here. The way that fraction is going to be undefined, and that's what we need, is the derivative of y with respect to x to be undefined to have a vertical tangent line. And, and since that derivative of y with respect to x is the fraction, where the derivative of x with respect to theta is the denominator, the way that fraction is undefined is if the denominator itself is zero. And as I was saying, before I caught my silly mistake, um, well, the vertical tangent lines are simple, sim similar, pardon me the way we find where we have vertical tangent lines. Well, what we need to remember is a vertical tangent line is where the slope is undefined or the derivative is undefined. Maybe that would be a, a better way to say it. Where the derivative is undefined is where we have vertical tangent lines. So let's, let's go way back to the beginning like we did so we can remember this. Well, we need the derivative of y with respect to x to be undefined, okay? See, that, that needs to be undefined to have a vertical tangent line. But when we're dealing with these polar equations, the derivative of y with respect to x is calculated by finding the derivative of y with respect to theta and dividing that by the derivative of x with respect to theta. So how do we have that fraction undefined? Well, for that fraction to be undefined, that denominator needs to be zero. Now, we can't let the numerator be zero, because if the numerator is zero, we have zero over zero, which is an indeterminate form, which means we don't know whether the derivative is undefined or not. So we, we have to ensure so that we can make a decision we have, to decide, we have to ensure that the, the derivative of y with respect to theta is not zero. So for a vertical tangent line, here's the condition that we need. We need the derivative of x with respect to theta to be equal to zero, but at that same theta value, the derivative of y with respect to theta cannot be equal to zero. And like I said, if for some reason they were both zero, then what that really tells us, it doesn't tell us we don't have a vertical tangent line, doesn't tell us we don't have a horizontal tangent line. It tells us that we don't have enough information for that theta to make a decision. And we would have to get we would have to do it another way. So we probably try to stay away from those types of problems where both derivatives are actually zero. Okay. So what we would end up doing here, in, in summary, we had already, on, on the previous page, we had calculated that the derivative of x with respect to theta 
was, uh, <clears throat> pardon me, negative 3 cosine squared theta minus 3 sine of theta plus 3 sine squared of theta. And we need that to be zero. See, that's that that's what we're trying to do is find out what causes that derivative to be zero. So we've got to solve an equation again. Ooh, this is kind of messy. Okay, let's let's look at what we would do here. I'm noticing in this is where I'm looking right here. Well, I'm looking at this equation. Um so let me kind of start over. Let me write down it, write it down as an equation. Negative 3 cosine squared theta minus 3 sine theta plus 3 sine squared theta equals 0. That's what we're trying to solve. And I'm noticing that I've got sines and cosines, and many times it's useful to try to convert into one single trig function. So I'm going to replace cosine squared theta with 1 minus sine squared theta. Then I have minus 3 sine theta plus 3 sine squared theta equals 0. Now as I distribute, this becomes what? Negative 3 times 1. Negative 3 times negative sine squared theta is plus 3 sine squared theta. Then minus 3 sine theta. And then plus 3 sine squared theta. And now I notice that I can combine a couple of those terms. So I'm going to rewrite it as 6 sine squared theta minus 3 sine theta minus 3 equals 0. And now I'm clearly we have a common factor of 3. I'm just going to divide both sides by 3. And that ends, ends up being 2 sine squared theta minus sine of theta minus 1 is equal to 0. Now, that left side is of quadratic type, and so I can factor it like I would a quadratic. Let's see if I can factor it this way. Uh, 2 times sine of theta plus 1 times sine of theta minus 1 equals 0. I believe that does it, doesn't it? <laughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> So I set each of these to zero, okay? Um, you know the routine. I'll take 2 sine theta plus 1, set it to zero. And similarly, I'll take sine of theta minus 1 and set it to zero. And so this becomes um, sine of theta is equal to negative 1 half. And that happens when theta is 7 pi over 6. And it also happens when theta is 11 pi over 6. This becomes, of course, sine of theta is equal to 1. And that happens only when theta is pi over 2. Now, if you recall, we kind of have the same situation that we had before. Um, and, and that is, if you recall the graph, there was only two places we were going to have a vertical tangent line. And so one of these thetas probably is not good. Um, but let, let's go through the routine, okay? So here's where we are. We found out where the derivative of x with respect to theta is zero. But now we have to decide whether any of these, call, remember what the, uh, you know, is. Uh, the derivative of y with respect to theta, which we had calculated earlier. Remember, we calculated it earlier. And it was uh, 3 cosine theta times 1 minus 2 sine theta. That's not what we calculated that to be. Is this equal to 0 for the... Um, discovered thetas for the thetas above. So we have to go through and, and calculate those. And so um, we would find, well, what's the derivative of y with respect to theta for uh, 7 pi over 6, the value theta 7 pi over 6. 
And uh, here's what I found out when I calculated that. I found out that um, I got a negative 3 root 3. I'm not doing this in order. I'm just doing it, I mean, in largest to smallest. So that's a good theta value, isn't it? And then I calculated the derivative of y with respect to theta uh, at 11 pi over 6. I'm not doing this in my head, folks. I've already calculated this. And this time I got a 3 root 3, which is not 0, so that's good. And then I calculated the derivative of y with respect to theta evaluated at the theta value pi over 2. That's the last theta value I've got. And when I did this calculation, I did get actually 0. And I'm not, sh I'm not showing the work. I hope that you understand that that's easy enough to do. So <clears throat> here's, here's where we are. Uh, this is a bad theta value. Those other two are good theta values. And so to get our points, we take our theta value that's 7 pi over 6, and we calculate the R value that goes with it. And the R value, remember, is 3 minus 3 times sine of theta. So 3 minus 3 times sine of 7 pi over 6. And when we do this calculation, we get 3 minus 3 times a negative 1 half. And that ends up being 9 halves. And likewise, I'm really running out of room, aren't I? 11 pi over 6, uh, 11 pi over six is our uh, other good theta value. And when we calculate our r there, we go through the same process. We'll have 3 minus 3 times sine of 11 pi over 6, which is going to be 3 um, minus 3 times a negative 1 half again. And so we end up getting 9 halves once again for our r value. So we have vertical tangent lines at these points, right? value of 9 halves and a theta value of 7 pi over 6. And an R value of 9 halves and a theta value of 11 pi over 6. And if we wanted to, we could convert, if we wanted to, we know how to convert those to rectangular coordinates by using the X equal R cosine theta and the Y equal R sine theta. It would be a simple conversion there. Okay, that's, um, that's the end of the discussion on uh, derivatives, slopes of tangent lines, uh, finding vertical and horizontal tangent lines of polar graphs. Good luck on your homework.